uh, in fact uh, in during pandemic uh, poverty rate has actually increased mm. now it stands at 860 million mm -hmm. which is a huge number right and i should say about 820 million people are going hungry every day mm -hmm. that's also not acceptable A very warm welcome to uh, next episode of Ink and Insights. I'm extremely pri privileged to have a very close friend of mine, Pradeep Baisak, today uh, at my show. Pradeep, thank you so much for being a part of you came to Nepal and then I could get hold of you and uh, thank you for your time. Thanks. Thanks. It's an opportunity for me also. Briefly, I'd like to uh, talk about Pradeep. Pradeep, um, presently, he is an Asia coordinator for a global call to uh, action against poverty. And uh, he's been a former journalist, development journalist, and he's into the development sector for the last uh, two decades now. He is also an author. His uh, book, Faces of Inequality, has won uh, two awards uh, from uh, Pariche Foundation. Uh, it was awarded as well as he, he was given a Kalinga Lit uh, Award. Pradeep, uh, it's, it's such an honor to have you in my show and we'll talk on range of issues. And I'm sure that your expertise um, will draw out of a lot of many things from your expertise. Um, this is your first time in Kathmandu, isn't it? Pradeep? Yes, yes, yes. So did you get a chance to go around places? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been, I mean, it's like this. I have, I have roamed around the world. I have not been to Kathmandu. It's strange. Right. People find, find it difficult to um, believe that I have not been to Nepal. Right. But anyway, it's a lovely place all the time. For Indians, Nepal is always close to our heart. Right. And Nepali people are like brothers and sisters. Right. right. And I, I as as actually extremely happy to be here. Uh, I meetings were there. That's over. I I took around to see lovely places in Kathmandu, some world heritage sites in Patan and one in Bhaktapur, the Darbar. Uh, no, all, yeah. all those who have been, which have been declared as world heritage sites. Mm -hmm. They're awesome, I should say. They have been preserved. That's very good that the government has preserved them. Right. And I also today went to Chandragiri Hills to see the mountains. Uh, that's also nice to had those um, car ride, cable car ride, or something right, they call right, it, right. and to to, have, to see the temple there, right, and to see the whole view. It's really lovely, wonderful, lovely, lovely country. In fact, right. Thank you, uh, Pradeep. Um, before I get inside, uh, before we talk about your book, uh, can you please set uh, light on some of the work that you are doing right now in terms of you know the action against poverty? Okay that organizations and its, you know, networks and all the stuff. So, so, so we have been working so much on uh, fighting inequality and poverty in all these years, 2004, we started Global Call to Action Against Poverty. This is a global campaign, civil society campaign, which works on inequality and poverty. And um, it's around sustainable development goals, mostly. And uh, we are, we are a huge network civil society, which, uh, uh, present in 66 countries were like really huge, mm -hmm. 11, 12,000 small and mid-sized NGOs who do work in their places and then put together energy and take, the, take, take this work at the grassroots to the global. So right. we are in a way connecting grassroots to the global, right. uh, raising these issues of inequality and poverty all through. Uh, so uh, our uh, unique character of ours is uh, the issue of inequality in India or uh, Nepal, if somebody is in that poor category, that voice we take to the UN systems in New, uh, in the New York. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we do quite a lot of work on that and constantly being engaged in the process of sustainable development goal, right. the agenda 2030, mm -hmm. and uh, have tried to influence the process from a from a point of view of most marginalized groups. Right, right. So how do you, how do you see this uh, scenario right now in terms of uh, you know, uh, a lot of lot of reports suggest that you know there's been decline in the poverty uh, rate and all the stuffs, but um, we see prevalent it uh, almost everywhere. In fact, uh, in during pandemic, uh, poverty rate has actually increased. Mm. Now it stands at eight sixty million, mm -hmm. which is a huge number. Right. And I should say about 820 million people are going hungry every day. Mm -hmm. That's also not acceptable. Right. 
look we, we are not dearth of resources we have huge resources see the kind of economic growth that has happened across the world mm -hmm. now you see it in the global south also in india in south eastern countries and it's right the wealth is created mm -hmm. the problem is that wealth is not distributed properly mm -hmm. it's lopsided distribution mm -hmm. most of the wealth go to the rich and elite that the the famous 99 versus 1 debate you have heard right and then one person takes most of the resources keeping behind very small resources for the 99 percent right during the pandemic an interesting thing has happened right during the pandemic we thought that economy is going down that's also true mm -hmm. the economic slump but then the resource has been created later we found out that the resource that has been created two-third of those resources has gone to top one person mm -hmm. and only one third of the resources have gone to 99 percent right this means there is an extreme uh, form of inequality which has come during pandemic right on one hand when the rich have gone too far richer and we have added more poor people into the list mm -hmm. those kind of systems are not acceptable right that's different. that's something which we have been raising right so in terms of inequality i should say we are not doing great we are rather falling apart right right the systems which are responsible for uh, global inequality or for that matter india inequality within the countries mm -hmm. look there is also inequality between global north and global south rich countries are richer right then we know the st state of affairs in african countries in some of the south asian countries True. that's one level of inequality global inequality and then that's another level within the country we see that uh, there are people who are getting richer and there are also a chunk of people who are below poverty line and they don't live a life of dignity. Mm -hmm. So we have all these been uh, raging on one hand uh, the issues, the, the faces, the, that's that's the basis. Mm -hmm. We have a faces of inequality campaign in global call to action against poverty. Mm -hmm. Where is, uh, we told that we will just not raise the issue of inequality will also bring those people who are in the in the poverty ladder so we will highlight them also mm, best I, in fact this book was inspired by that campaign right, right. i i i brought this uh, title from the in a way borrowing from right. that yeah, yeah, yeah. and i have uh, brought in some of the stories of poor and marginalized people here mm -hmm. um the, the political and economic systems are essentially responsible for this. It's not that mm -hmm. the problems are not visible. Problems are visible not only to us, it's mm -hmm. visible to the world now. Everybody, right. Right. a person at the top also knows. Mm -hmm. It's also not uh, that the people don't know it, know the reasons, they know it. Right. Only there is lack of will to address it. Right, right. Nobody wants to lose the power, eh? nobody wants to will the wealth. Right. So do you do you feel that there has been this another side of debate as well, wherein sometimes it's said that, you know, there was a time wherein there a lot of voice in favor of, uh, you know, poor people and there was anti-poverty sort of campaign, which was at the top. Now the context seems to have changed and these issues seems to have taken uh, a backseat. Right. So where, where, where does the have the context also led to sort of deterioration of wherein people are really not interested in taking this forward this kind of issues mm, that's that's apparently a change because of the change of our political system i i told you political economic system mm -hmm. look the way democracy functions what we have been seeing in the years initially at, at one point we believe that okay people probably have control over democracy the, right. the government that we elect eventually we learn that no we are just uh, poor people having one vote Right. Nothing beyond that. Right. And that vote can also be manipulated by parties right. uh, using different means. They, they can divide us and rule based on caste, religion, race, and they can use unnecessary issues to divide people. Mm -hmm. And people are also, it's, it's, you know, sometimes we say we get the government we deserve. Mm -hmm. It's not all fault of the political parties and right. establishment and the, and the people who control it. We should also take a bit of for that. Mm -hmm. um, look around and see how policy has framed. It's mostly corporate influences the policies. 
government, uh, the political parties get uh, political funding from the corporate, and that's that's essentially determines. Right. It may not quite come to the open uh, uh, for it may not quite be known to everybody, mm-hmm. but that's how it works. The nexus between the political parties and the corporate is very high, and it's increasing. Mm-hmm. That's a global trend right now. That, that's everywhere, almost everywhere. Right. Because the um, political parties are almost kind of controlled by corporate and are uh, putting in policies which are favorable to corporate, that's where the inequality has been ex- exacerbated. Uh-huh. It's time that they, they learn it. Inequality cannot go on and on and on. There will be social tensions. It's already happening. Uh-huh. It's already happening. Right. If there is extreme inequality, social tensions will happen. Right. You will find, you know, um, protest here and there, you know, and see you see the way climate change is also happening. Right. It's, it's the greed. When the greed takes over, then then at one point you are unable to manage it. So, and my understanding is this is the tipping point. Right. You reverse this trend. Otherwise, you are actually entering into a very dangerous job. Right. So, Pradeep, you are also, uh, you also look after the entire Asia. Uh, um, so, could you also shed some light on the status of the poverty and inequality in our South Asia region? Where do we stand? Look, officially, the poverty figures are going down in most of the countries, mm-hmm. which is okay. That's quite, quite some um, good sign. Mm-hmm. But what happens is, I mean, many many people won't also agree to the government official figures, right. the hidden poverty there. And then poverty has also been now redefined, just not poverty in terms of income, but also multidimensional poverty. Right. Right. It was in, it used to be how much um, well, uh, calorie of food you are intaking now. Now sure. poverty has been redefined. Mm-hmm. You have access to health, you have access to education, you have access to basic Look, everybody has a right to to a, a, the life of dignity, the mm-hmm. minimum living standard, which which doesn't snatch away dignity from you. Mm-hmm. If we understand that as a poverty, then I don't think we are doing great. Right. right. In terms of government figures, probably then they are saying okay, and that's also true that uh, the wealth that has been created also partially reduce the level of poverty mm-hmm. but then the, now pandemic has come and and the new poverty the new set of poor people have been added so it's uh, i mean i'm not really happy with just saying that we have poverty figures were reduced by before before covid at least what the government was claiming right that's not that doesn't actually give a complete picture right so also how strong or weak uh, the coalition that's among some of the civil society organizations in South Asia right now, in terms of addressing, I mean, I've been to working in this <laughs> in this field for so many years. Right. Civil society does raise voice. They are also strong in a way. Right. Strong, strong in two three things. One, bringing in the bringing the issue to the fore. Mm-hmm. That have been true. We are also mobilizing people around it. Right. But where, whether this has got eyes with the government is a million dollar question. Mm-hmm. Well, the government listen to, listens to us, implements our suggestions. That's also that's that also question, question. important question. Yeah. <laughs> Look, out of ten, they may pick up one and implement it and say, "Okay, we are doing your work." Mm-hmm. But the whole character has to change. What we are saying is, you bring in transformative reforms, right? Just not uh, some reform here and there, and giving little more resources to the. Look, the social protection level of South Asia is not great. Okay. This is the time we are demanding now. After the pandemic, that's something which learning has come. Okay. That you should at least uh, have enough money, uh, pump the public money for universal health coverage. Right. If we had that, we probably could have saved a lot of lives which we lost during pandemic. That's big learning. Sure. Second is what we are demanding is universal social protection also. Mm-hmm. Look, you have resources. You, you invest them, create a base of social protection. So the poor, the elderly, the indigenous groups, the Dalits, the uh, people with disabilities, the women are not left behind. Right. Yeah. You, that's, why, that's why governance is important. True. Yeah. And then um, 
We are also offering solutions. Mm -hmm. Tax the rich, increase the tax base. Uh, another tax which we are um, uh, now advocating is wealth tax. Mm -hmm. For example, you are a son of a billionaire father. Okay. Your father transfers all the billion to you. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you become a billionaire. Mm -hmm. Are you not supposed to pay a little bit tax to the government right. that you became a billionaire? Right. And I am a son of a poor uh, farmer. What I inherit is poverty. Mm. Then, then the cycle of inequality continues. Right. That's what we are saying. You impose a modest in wealth tax. There's so many rich people. Let's talk something about your book as well, uh, Pradeep. What is this book all about, Faces of Inequality? Okay. I mean, it suggests that, you know, there are a lot of cases of inequality yeah. uh, you have brought in. But could you uh, please uh, generate yeah, yeah, let me. You know, I've been a development journalist all through. Yeah. So I picked up is, I've, uh, I've consciously gone to villages to see people, how they are living and all. And uh, I picked up the stories of poverty. Mm -hmm. The first story that you will see is the story of uh, Jintu Bariya, that's of starvation death. We are now sophisticatedly saying it's hunger-related death. Starvation because probably has become in, got into controversy. Whatever it is, the person who is dying of hunger, dying, not having food. Right. You call it hunger, death or starvation death. Whatever you call it, that's a death which you are supposed to, mm -hmm. supposed not to go through. Right. If a person is dying, I'll not say it's his fault. It's the it's the government's fault, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If we have policies for that way, it's not implemented. That, the, the, that's one chapter, which I have done. Then um, kindly bringing in the food insecurity among the people, which has led to deaths. Then we have uh, issues around migration, distress migration. Mm -hmm. We have issues around farmers suicide. Mm -hmm. and uh, right to information and all the many other issues. Right. right. So, uh, <coughs> what is what is this about distress migration and can you also set some lights on farmer suicide? Yeah. What is the sort of uh, trend in India right now? Look, um, in on farmer suicide, what the story that I have done was done before five years. There are some people who have committed suicide. You remember though that time P. Sainath has also brought in massive farmer suicide which was done in India. Mm -hmm. He continuously wrote about it and he was also quoting the government figure. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> over a period of, a period of time, what has happened in India particularly is while you adapted for economic liberalization in 1991, True. There is a, it's my understanding, I'm sure it's understanding of many of the mm -hmm. pro people journalists, that there is a conscious uh, attempt to neglect the agri sector. Normally what happens if industrialization is there, and it's expected that people will leave the primary sector and come to the secondary and tertiary sector. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the theory which we have studied. Right. That normal happens. But then if you go deep into it, it may probably sound like if you do not neglect the uh, agri-sector, mm -hmm. then people will not be forced into informal, eco informal sector in cities that we need them. Right, mm -hmm. right. Probably, uh, consciously, un unconsciously, whatever, or that's the pattern of uh, capitalistic development, I do not know. Mm. You will ask those big economists who are sitting there. Mm -hmm. But there is a conscious negligence of agriculture. Agriculture has not been promoted. But this is in India as well. Indi India as well. Mm. Oh, India as well means you are saying that in Nepal that also. No, I mean, I'm just looking at the trend. <laughs> <laughs> India, it has happened. Yeah, yeah. And it has not only led to mass outflux of people from uh, from agri, right. and it's not it's not that the people who are coming out of agriculture you are giving a, a class one job somewhere in the in in a private company. It doesn't happen like that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There are poor people who are uneducated who who will continue to work on their paddy fields. True. If it is not uh, properly managed, that that's the reason why people have committed suicide. The, I mean, died by suicide, attempted suicide. Mm -hmm. They have been forced to borrow uh, from private lenders, from government. Government borrowing system doesn't work. Right. And they have to turn to private lenders, then, then the extortion. Mm -hmm. There are also microfinances which have come in between. Mm -hmm. It is not now that, that they have been tamed a little bit, but there was a time when if 
poor people need they go to microfinances and they are so extortive mechanism absolutely that you end up and then uh, the, the issues of crop loss they are not covered mm-hmm. what does that person do mm-hmm. he has uh, some loan on his head he is expected to um, repay the loan by selling the paddy and right. paddy that crop is fed right government is not covering right. what does the person do there are series of suicides there one such case uh, it's a series of case i also did in the book right and now also things have not changed much we are also hearing the uh, cases of farmer suicide uh, across country okay. we are even that so this uh, <coughs> these cases are documented between what time frame uh, the, uh, this is documented between 2009 to 2020 okay. yeah the book was published in 2021 right so I've kind of packed my writing during the decade so uh, 2009 10 to 2020 and the cases are, are uh, in sort the, of yeah. covered from the entire country or uh, no it's of, more uh, mostly yeah, entire country in fact some yeah. some some of from my province odisha but it has also been covered from entire country yeah right how much we said the one that i did is from my province hmm. but i have analyzed the whole issue of farmers agree of at the from a national point of view mm-hmm. do you think post covid context uh there's sort of inclination from the government side to have a real look and to sort of reemphasize on the importance of the agriculture given the change in the context you know the government has always claimed that we are doing great for the farmers mm-hmm. the question down there then they should understand if you have done great for the farmers right why then there is farmer suicide true true they 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 they're saying well we are doing great we have crop insurance we have uh, provided loans so all that they are doing uh, i mean they should sit sit down talk to people like us right and there are many experts to listen to the farmers very recently we had farmers protest uh-huh. it went on year long protest people lost their lives yeah protest. we saw that on news yeah everyone yeah in in if you are so sensitive to the farmers mm-hmm. in the day one you should have sat with them Mm-hmm. Ask why you are protesting. What we are, we think we are doing good for you. What's the problem? Sit, sit, sit down with them. Discuss. Solution will come. Only if you are willing to address them. Otherwise, mm-hmm. uh, do whatever you want to do. So uh, you think the in a years to come? I mean, there's also a debate on you know the. Uh, uh legitimacy of the civil society organs and itself you know the way it came uh into prominence during during post 1990s and the, the way right now it's been situated um there are critics who say that civil society organizations are not you know working enough to sort of pressurize the government uh to implement the kind of pro people policies that's required i mean over a period of time that legitimacy has gone down do you agree with that i mean uh, i and the people have said that right over a period of time what i have seen of the civil society is uh, there is a changing pattern mm-hmm. people actually in the civil society in the localized ngo we have seen people work very hard the ngo workers reach to the home where governments own streets and um, do the service and all that's look ngo has also its limitations right mm-hmm. ngos work best on funding that they receive from foreign governments for that matter indian um, philanthropies all right they also have limitations mm-hmm. huh? and um, if if nowadays the government has almost kind of stopped funding through di- different legislations fcra has been uh, made strict and mm-hmm. then so how do the ngos then thrive right it the uh, government probably wants that you just work on um, uh, not questioning us not the questioning the structural aspects of poverty and inequality you do something which which is not a problem for us right then the, what the ngos have to do they will do it yeah so how many times it also depends what kind of situation you create in the country mm-hmm. civil society is also part of the various you know that's part of our democratic voice right, right, right. it's part of our freedom of right. speech right if you speak something against the government if you are an enemy of government mm-hmm. then the democracy is also you know the the values of democracy also sliding so in such case becomes difficult for the ngos to raise voice right 
um, one of the reasons that's also not on not just in our region that's across now it is i don't know why it is happening mm-hmm. so we'll have to dig more into why the civic space is shrinking across that's one of the topics that we are discussing at the global level throughout, throughout the world throughout the world yeah. it's happening yeah civic space the freedom of speech press has also been uh, throttled so uh, pradeep that's going to be my last question to you i i mean you know uh, that's all related with the changing time and the context uh, every institutions today are questions everything is in a state of flux perhaps uh, do you agree if i say that uh, there's a need for civil society organization to relook and uh, Uh, in terms of their approach and the strategy and then uh, redefine themselves in a way that could fit in with the changing context. I agree. Yeah. On that, I strongly agree. It's yeah. for the civil society to raise, actually, voice pitch their, uh, make their voice much louder. Mm-hmm. Look, civil society is no adjunct to the government. Sure. It need not be fearing the government. If, uh, we are in a very bad state in so far as our polity, economy and society is concerned. Right. Right. we are in a kind of emergency if you, for the civil society it's necessary to reinvent that you actually put hard questions uh-huh. if you do not uh, raise the questions where many people are suffering in a, in a, in a really big way then eventually you are also losing faith of the people that we are working with yeah you're losing that yeah, yeah absolutely I, i mean yeah, yeah. because you, because you are also because of various pressures we are also turning ourselves down true to protect our existence right and eventually we are also losing uh, losing our own constituency mm-hmm. if we if we are unable to bring the issues of the constituency that we work and now we should put it really straight forward mm-hmm. and say what we are doing is wrong right let's put it that straight uh, in the process you may lose funding and all It's fine, mm-hmm. but then this is the time that we raise our voice louder and louder. Right. Yeah. And on a personal note, uh, are you all, uh, planning to write some of the other stuff right now? In terms uh, of I'm and... working. I'll not announce it, but I'm working on my second book. Right. Um, hoping to complete it one year. Let's. See if it happens. You know, you are also an author. You, it takes a lot of time to write. <laughs> it does. Just when you are a full-time, uh, you know, employee yeah. somewhere, you would do friend. Yeah, you have I'm to s- balance everything. Together. I am struggling to complete the book in one year. Yeah, and probably hope to see you again then on, the, on my second book. Sure, sure, absolutely. It's my honor, Pradeep. Thank you so much for your time once again. Thanks, Thank you for being part of it. That's show. been an opportunity. Thanks, thanks. thanks.